uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, we're hoping this is going to be an interactive session, so if you'd like to move closer to the front. I was kind of hoping to be addressing a slightly bigger audience when I said that, but okay. Um, so the idea behind this session is, is really to promote discussion um, and to try something a little different. So we're not going to talk at you for very long. Um, there's three of us here. We also have a video presentation uh, from one of our colleagues uh, to help us avoid some emissions. We didn't all fly over to Switzerland. Uh, I'm Dr. Ed Morgan, and I work at Griffith University in the Griffith Climate Change Response Program. And we, uh, along with several colleagues, Dr. Tim Cadman and Stan, Stanley Wapo is, is here. Uh, we've been working on uh, a participatory action research project looking at primary forest protection. And it's not got a very catchy title, I'll be honest with you. Uh, an integrated community-based approach to managing landscape for conservation, climate change, and sustainable livelihoods. And the reason it doesn't have a very catchy title is because actually we recognize the interconnectedness of all of these things and that they are all important. So it's not simply climate change. It's not simply sustainable livelihoods. Um, it's not simply conservation. It is all of these things. And we want to highlight it's all of these things. And we want to highlight that it's about communities and that it's integrated. Uh, and that leaves us with a very long and not very catchy title, but we do think it's important. So just a little bit about the project. Um, I'm going to introduce it a bit. Then I'm going to talk about uh, my role within it and then the role of landscape planning within it. Uh, and then uh, we'll hear a little bit more from the other members of the team about their role in it and, and what we're trying to do. So as I said, it's transdisciplinary. It's applied research program um, to promote the protection of the world's remaining tropical primary forests. And it's a collaboration between ourselves at Griffith University, uh, the Woods Hole Research Center, which many of you may know, the Wild Foundation, uh, the Center for Ethics, Governance and Law, also based at Griffith, the International Conservation Fund of Canada, the Australian Rainforest Conservation Society, and Forests Alive. So there's a real mix of NGOs, activist organizations, uh, and academics. And we're all trying to work together in an integrated way, uh, which is always a challenge, I think. And that's part of the theme that we'd like to talk about, is the challenge of, of working together across all sorts of different, uh, not only academic disciplines, but... Uh, um, so outside of academia and beyond that. So there's four key components to it, and I will only talk on the first two briefly. Uh, one is about, because the people aren't here to present on their bid, uh, they were, one of them were hoping to be here, but he's an IPCC author and it's IPCC author time. Uh, so <laughs> he had to uh, not make it, unfortunately. Um, so, but he's involved in creating a in global information database on primary forests, specifically focused on primary forests, um, and making sure these data are useful for policy. There's also, um, we have uh, colleagues looking at um, understanding and informing international policy. So going around the big international policy meetings and talking to people about the importance of primary forests. Zooming down a little bit from that big global view, we have two components, which are the components myself and my colleagues here are, are really focused on. One is about looking at microeconomic analysis and trying to develop and test a metho methodology for verifying business case for carbon finance and other payments for ecosystem services, and you'll hear a bit more about that later. And then we have case studies, and I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking a bit more about the case studies and what we want to try and do. And the case studies are about tying all the different elements we've got, which is sort of the... the the science, the GIS, um, but also uh, governance and planning, which uh, is really our expertise here in the room. Um, and building on the theme of the uh, conference here, um, we're interested in transformation. Um, and the theme that we, we pitched this to was how do we support transformation? So we want to support communities to govern their forests and their landscapes. And we want to provide economic tools to help value 
these ecosystems that are part of that landscape. And we want to have planning to help manage change because these communities are facing change. Um, and really, we need to do all of those things. We need governance to support collaboration and participation. So we're trying to help communities determine what is important to them by transforming governance and management so that they don't necessarily have to transform their landscapes. And just to give you a bit of a background for those who maybe aren't familiar with primary forests and why they're important, there's a very short little video. Sorry, I think I forgot to turn that on. I apologize. <laughs> um, so, but there are lots of similarities. So there's quite strong land rights in all of these cases, and that was important for us um, because uh, having the, the local people, the local communities, having land rights gives them a, a level of control. But at the same time, then, these rights are not actually always um, respected. Um, and the picture you see is actually of... Kaipo territory in the Amazon, and you can spot where the Kaipo have their territory because that's where the trees still are, and everything around it has gone. But this is still forest. That's the forest, the the land that they own, 
Um, it's protected in the Constitution, Brazilian Constitution. Um, uh, but there is still a lot of illegal mining and, and logging going on. In Melanesia, uh, customary land ownership is, is the norm. Everybody there owns land, uh, and you're not allowed to sell it. It's, it you can only lease it. Uh, and the Democratic Republic of Congo has a similar sort of arrangement. And generally, and this is a sweeping generalization, there's of course lots of different people with lots of different views, but generally there is a desire to try and protect the forest, try and keep the forests because they're culturally important. Um, the generally subsistence livelihoods, hunting, fishing, um, some forms of uh, subsistence agroforestry in Melanesia, uh, but they're all facing significant change from the outside, and, and this is common to all sorts of indigenous um, people and communities across the world. Uh, but there's also differences among them. Um, so the Kayapo really are facing uh, border protection issues. They can't protect their borders from illegal logging and mining, despite their very strong control they supposedly have over it. They can basically do what they like within their territory, uh, but it's still difficult to police. Melanesia is facing population growth and development. Um, and the Democratic Republic of Congo really has no functioning government to speak of. Uh, it's, it's complicated in that way. Uh, but in some ways that has helped protect their forests because large companies can't come in there. Or if they do, then they get a lease to do some logging. You know, in, in several weeks' time or several months' time, that person is no longer in charge of anything and their lease is now meaningless. Um, and I think it's important to point out that although there's limited capacity, um, in many cases, resources are not actually scarce in these areas. These communities are not poor, uh, although we would describe them as poor and, and poverty would be described as an issue. They do lack cash in that sense, but in some places, cash is not actually that helpful. Again, varies quite a lot across the case study. Um, the challenge they face is actually more their interactions with this increasingly globalized world and how they manage that change. They are facing um, you know, new things coming in and they want some of them and they don't want other things. Um, and they are, uh, we like to say, they're in the wrong economy. Uh, they don't fit uh, neatly the, the, the modern Western neoliberal economy that we have. So they can quite easily be taken for a ride by loggers uh, and it can, they can very easily lose their trees um, and get compensation for them. They, they get some more, small amount of cash, but it, it's not really the, a fair value of, of what they're giving up. But they're under pressure. They're under pressure to log their primary forests. They have a desire for development and goods, for engaging with this global economy, and there's also corruption and legal logging. So what we're really interested in is are there ways these communities to harness the value of their forests, because we believe that these forests have huge value without resorting to extraction. Can we build a conservation economy, the right economy, that matches their livelihood ambitions and forest protection? And what is it that needs is needed for them to transform to this economy or to fit this economy into the global, um, national, regional, and local context. And this is where microeconomics and planning um, and governance come in. So microeconomics to really help actually understand the actual value of this product. Planning, which is my area of expertise, to really support the management of the forests and think about change and development that they're facing and how they might do it. And governance, which Tim will talk more about in a minute and uh, hopefully get you to engage in, uh, to ensure participation, collaboration, and equity. Um, I just, that's kind of the end of the introduction, really. I just wanted to highlight the team. Um, so the Griffith team on the left there uh, is all of us, uh, just to give you some idea of how big the team is. And then the case studies we're working through, all these uh, great organizations that we work with. Um, and... Uh, yes, so to give you some sense, you know, we're all sort of academics uh, of various sorts um, and everyone else is, is NGO uh, and, well, Stanley will talk about himself and, and his role uh, a bit later on. So that's to give you a background and a sense of what it is we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it and what's important. Um, 
I'd like to now talk just a little bit about the planning aspect of this, which is the bit that I have the pleasure of uh, undertaking. So this project, I should say, has been going a little over 18 months now. So we're still developing ideas and coming up with ways of doing this um, and developing partnerships on the ground. And all the case studies are at different phases of this and the different move further on and move further, or not so far moved on. Um, so from a planning perspective, it's really important um, to highlight that forests uh, don't really exist separately from people very often. It's not really, there's not that many forests that are completely separate from people. Forests are resources for people. Forests are places to live for people. Um, uh, there's traditional ownership, as I talked about, and forests are culturally important to people, and that's often forgotten. But also, forests are not separate from their surrounding geography. So are some water catchments, their soil maintainers, their lungs of the planet, as we sometimes describe the Amazon. So from a planning point of view, protecting forests is actually about people and livelihoods. The people are living in these forests and using these forests. They want livelihoods. Um, and what that looks like uh, might vary hugely, but we can't necessarily say to them, you know, give over this forest because we want to store our carbon there because we've poured carbon into the atmosphere and we wish to uh, lock it up somewhere. Or if we are going to say that, then maybe we should be compensating them for it. So we think we really want to try and work towards, as I talked about, was harnessing the benefits of the forest, but harnessing it for the community so that the community actually benefit. To do that, you've got to balance the social and ecological benefits. This is about trade-offs and this is about synergies. Um, as we know, with any um, landscape, with any use of a landscape, if you use it, there are trade-offs. So we need to take a holistic approach. We can't just think about simply the trees, because this is the mistake we make. We have to think about the whole landscape, the trees and, how they, and the forest, but how it interacts with the rest of the landscape. Is it purifying our water for us? And if so, is that a service we should be paying for in some way, or at least looking after? But also, these communities wish to use the land. How can they use the land in a way that doesn't destroy the forest assuming that is what they want. So to do this, we're looking at landscape planning, or I'm looking at landscape planning. And landscape planning is planning at the landscape scale. And for anyone that's been in some of the talks, there's always lots of discussion about what's the landscape scale, what is a landscape, how do we define it. In planning terms, there's lots of literature out there. But it's an interesting combination of both strategic planning so identifying opportunities and goals of the community at a um, bigger scale is so something that isn't simply about land use. It's about wants and needs and values, but also land use planning. To then link those to the land that is there and identify what the best land uses are to achieve these goals. And I put best in inverted commas because we don't necessarily know what that is. We may never necessarily know exactly what that is. That is down to people. Planning is a, an interesting discipline. It means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, but there's a few generalis generalities that we can draw. It's future driven. Uh, it's about balancing competing values and negotiating and discussing those. Uh, there is a strong move towards participation and collaboration within planning, a recognition that centralized technocratic planning is really failed. This, uh, this turn towards um, we will just work out uh, the, la the landscape is and, and what it does, and then we'll just chop it up and assign it correctly, has really let us down for lots of obvious reasons in a way. Uh, it's far too uncertain. It's far too complex. But planning is also about turning knowledge into action. So planning is about harnessing what we do know and what people know and turning that into actions that we try and we hope 
they do whatever it is we set out to do. And planning is a praxis, and this is really important. It's a, it's a practice about, it's about what people do. So it's not a simple theory. It's not a, a knowledge base. It is really very much an on-the-ground activity. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with sort of what planning tends to involve, and there's no one way of doing it, and I've just tried to really break down sort of the, the, the essence of planning, if you like, the things that you do within planning. Um, a lot of it is about trying to understand the context, trying to understand biophysical, social, cultural, drivers of change, different values of whoever it is you're working with, whoever it is you're trying to plan with or for, depending on what sort of planning you're doing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And it's about identifying a shared vision, usually through some sort of workshop process, although there's other things, and some sort of shared understanding of the current landscape. So that you come at it from a point of there is a shared, this is sometimes in the landscape approach called a shared entry point. This is something that really resonates in planning, is you need some shared understanding and some shared goal that says, yes, by and large, we all agree, or the majority of us agree, that we should be trying to do this. And if you look across plans, visions vary from all sorts of things, uh, depending on who has written it and how it's been written. And if you do that and you create the shared understanding, you can then think about the future. And planning is trying to get people to think about the future. Where is it going? What's going to happen? We can identify potential policies, in inverted commas. These are activities, decisions, land uses. They can be a variety of things. Identify the best policies the ones we think are going to lead us to the vision and are going to be robust, which is an important part. It's no good having activities you think, yeah, this will work, if as soon as anything changes, it falls apart. And then we draw up a plan, and this might look like land use maps, it might have zones, it might have restrictions and regulations, it might just be a list of activities that you're going to do. Importantly, it should always include monitoring and evaluation, which is often missing in planning uh, and is a real challenge. In the context of this project, what's really important is that we have deliberative and participatory planning. And for me, that is about thinking of planning as a co-learning, two-way knowledge transition process. So it is not about us going in and going, aha, well, I know all about trees and forests, uh, so I'm going to tell you how it is you should manage these trees and forests. Because I only know one aspect of trees and forests, and I probably don't even know that very well. Uh, the community live in the trees, they live in the forest. They know at least as much as I do about it, if not probably more, which is not to say that the knowledge that I can bring or we can bring as academics, as researchers, is not useful, but it is not, can't be imposed upon. And this involves community engagement, involves participation, and the catch-all term is community-led participatory landscape planning. This is what we want to try and do, I want to try and do. But it's really challenging because it is about engaging with communities. Communities are very different from myself, uh, with very different values. Uh, and how do I go about doing that? How do we as a team go about doing that? Well, there's lots and lots of tools out there. There's, there's probably as many tools as there are people doing this sort of thing. Um, and as with everything in planning, and I can't emphasize this enough, context is key and understanding the context is, is vital. Um, so I've, I've pulled up lots of different things that aren't necessarily called plans and aren't necessarily called planning, but that I would class as parts of or totals of planning things. And I tended to look at um, developing country contexts, community country, community contexts, and, and forests, and really working on well, okay. How do, I do, how do I work out? What are, what are the tools that are going to work in these case studies? What is, you know, can there be a common framework? But that might be uh, a bit optimistic. Planning rarely fits neatly to that. So what is it that, that I can do, that the landscape planning can do? And it's not really me that will do it. It's the communities that will do it. Well, I can help communities with decision making, or they can help themselves with decision making. As I talked about before, it can help share knowledge. So scientific knowledge down to communities, but actually local knowledge back up to policymakers and other stakeholders. So that other stakeholders can really begin to understand what is these people experiencing and what do they value and what would they like to do. 
uh, we can influence policymakers. Um, so one of the key things in one of the case studies in, in Brazil with the Kayapo, the, um, all indigenous, uh, indigenous tribes that have land rights are being asked to, and it's legally mandated that they must do a strategic plan. Uh, and it is now becoming, the, and, and the idea is with this strategic plan, they can go to the government and say, this is what we're going to do, this is what we want. Can you please either leave us alone to get on with it or help us do it? So they should be able to say, we do not want logging and mining. Please stop the logging and mining that's coming in. Now, it's illegal logging and mining, and the government have limited resources, but at least it's a formal way of saying. Um, and it can support fundraising. So again, in the Kayapo case, money will not flow unless they have this, this plan in place. Uh, but in a classic piece of planning, for those of you familiar with it, uh, they legally mandated they had to have these plans, and they provided no legally mandated funding for it. So we're helping to try and help the Kayapo develop this with our partners in Brazil. But planning doesn't really stand alone. Um, it's really linked to the other components. So the forest knowledge base that's being developed by my colleagues is absolutely crucial to support this understanding and this co-learning. What can we tell people about their forests that they don't know? What can we tell them about climate change? They recognize things are changing, but they don't necessarily know what climate change is. If you go to them and say, hey, you're facing climate change, they go, what? Huh? You have to talk about it in a much more sensible way. But there's useful knowledge there. We can maybe begin to think about how they might adapt and maybe help them. But only on their terms and only by sharing our knowledge and in a way that is relevant to them. Um, economics can help identify community values, and that'll be the next talk shortly. And governance standards, which Tim will talk about, is, is really to help us ensure equitable participation and collaboration. And the real challenge we have is that we need to do this in an integrated way. It's no good me just doing planning the way I want to do planning um, without taking into account everything else that's gone on. Um, so that's a bit of a background to what I'm trying to do. Um, I'll to happily take any questions if there are some while I load up the next presentation, which is a video presentation from our colleagues. In yeah. Oh. Thank you. Um, uh, you talk about economics to help identify community values, but values are not necessarily economic. Yes. Um, excellent question. Uh, and um, it's probably, probably uh, identified um, by oversimplification there. So, no, they're absolutely not. Um, and I was not intending to suggest that uh, economics was the only way or indeed necessarily the most important way uh, to identify values. And the planning process is all about identifying values in as many different ways as possible. But as uh, the video presentation I'm about to do will hopefully demonstrate, um, we're looking at economics in a slightly different, slightly broader sense that can try and bring some of these, these values um, into an economics framework. Uh, and if there are no other questions, that actually leads me really nicely on to the presentation, which is fresh off the press. It was literally sent to us. Globally, around 600 million people call forests home, mostly in the world's tropical regions. A further 800 million people depend, to some extent, on forests to provide for their livelihoods. The world's primary forests remain under significant threat from damaging government policies, economic activities that promote deforestation, and biophysical changes set in train by climate change. Logging for timber and clearing to make way for mining, cropping, grazing and urban development continue to make inroads into the remaining large areas of intact forest. This has well-documented impacts on biodiversity and greenhouse gas emissions, but it also impinges on the people who live in and depend on these forests for livelihoods. 
Formerly protecting forests has proven necessary but insufficient for maintaining large areas of intact forests from external immediate pressures such as incursion by timber getters, agricultural interests and mining companies. People also live amongst these forests, supporting their livelihoods from the ecosystem services the forests provide, such as subsistence food and materials, and also supplies of marketable products that they might trade. The forests are also the basis for indigenous cultures and cosmologies. Their relationships to country is intimately tied to the cycles of nature, their patterns of natural resource harvesting, and to their connections between past, current, and future generations. On a different scale, these forests are highly valued by the global community as one of the key re global stocks of sequestered carbon. 25% of all terrestrial carbon is stored in forests, and the importance of specifically intact primary forests as global carbon stocks is only now being fully appreciated. Together, these local, regional, and global values can be thought of as representing a basket of benefits. Environmental economics plays a role in demonstrating or quantifying, often in dollar terms, many of these values. Economics can also play a role in designing schemes that can help forest communities begin to capture the value of more of the benefits provided by their conservation efforts. The full spectrum of these ecosystem service values can be assessed through the concept of total economic value, or TEV. Using the framework of TEV, ensures all aspects of ecosystem service value are considered in decision-making. TEV distinguishes between use and non-use values. Direct use values are those where the output is consumed directly by people, such as timber getting, harvesting of wild animals, and tourism experiences. Direct use values can often be valued using traditional economic techniques. Indirect use values are derived from goods and services that people benefit from as an outcome of ecological functions, which would otherwise continue regardless of human activation. For example, we benefit from a more stable climate thanks to the preservation efforts of forest communities. Floods are mitigated by the action of upstream land managers in maintaining vegetation cover. These values start to get more difficult to consistently measure. Non-use values variously include bequest, vicarious, and existence values. Those values where we receive value from our own knowledge that other people or future generations are deriving utility. Or for our own intrinsic altruistic values we experience from nature. An option value is that inherent in maintaining use and non-use values into the future. Estimating these values rely on techniques from environmental economics. The fundamental problem of environmental economics stems from the premise that the activities that provide value for one person are often in conflict with another. Exchanges of value are needed, but often we lack the institutions to enable values to be traded off. Opportunities to exchange value is not only needed between different levels of environmental service delivery, but also between different communities of interest. One group of people may be custodians of a habitat that provides ecosystem services to another. For example, foregoing income from the sale of timber or refraining from clearing forests to make way for a palm oil plantation is a cost or opportunity cost to those undertaking the conservation, yet they have no mechanism for which to receive compensation and the beneficiaries of maintained ecological function often have no requirement to make good. Instead, they can free ride. Understanding where the value proposition lies is a key part of understanding how a forest conservation economy can be financed and structured to both protect forests and improve human well-being. Working out who benefits from conservation actions and when and how they benefit is a starting point. Conversely, understanding who foregoes opportunities or income, who pays the costs, obviously comes next. Watershed services, such as the retention of forest cover to provide drinking water or to reduce sediment flowing into a coral reef lagoon, is a further example where one party is providing a service, in this instance clean water and a healthy reef, to 
for which it does not receive compensation from another party, perhaps a beach hotel complex, that is benefiting from high levels of environmental quality. Exchanges of economic value such as these need mechanisms that can enable that exchange. One such enabling concept is Payments for Ecosystem Services, or PES. PES is an exchange of value for the retention of functioning ecosystems, often in the form of cash or in-kind payments, in exchange for the preservation of habitats. Often this value exchange is international in nature, a transfer from the global north to the global south under schemes such as Red Plus. However, such distances, both geographic and cultural, can clearly cause difficulties for governance in ensuring both parties uphold their commitments. PES schemes are characterized as being voluntary, fair, based on conditionality, and as being pro-poor. They can be structured in a number of ways, depending on the emphasis given to each of these attributes. Fully commoditized schemes are those that emphasize conditionality on the outcomes achieved, the amount of carbon stored in a reforestation project, for example. Other types of schemes emphasize behavioral change, such as refraining from earning income from deforestation. Often in such schemes, poverty reduction outcomes are included. Thirdly, there are hybrid versions that emphasize co-investment in landscape stewardship and local resource management, where buyers and sellers of services are less well defined. PES schemes of all three flavors will play a significant role in tropical forest preservation into the future. The microeconomics teams from Griffith University in Brisbane and Woods Hole Research Center in Massachusetts are working as part of an interdisciplinary team on a primary forest project using three case studies in Melanesia, Brazil, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Each of the case studies present different challenges for understanding how local economic and biophysical factors and property right arrangements impact on people's potential for livelihoods from forest economies and how PES schemes can be designed. To help start answer some of these questions, we are carrying up field studies using two survey methods, Q method and choice experiments. We are also carrying out a systematic literature review to document the global state of knowledge on the economic value of the ecosystem services provided by primary forests. Q method can determine dominant discourses amongst groups of people. It looks for commonalities in the way people think about their world. In answer to a primer question, we ask people through strategic sampling to rank issues by sorting statement cards in a quasi-normal distribution. The card set is constructed from observations from focus groups and interviews where people are encouraged to discuss issues within the domain of interest. As such, it can uncover non-hypothesized concepts. Once all the sampling is completed, the data is subject to statistical analysis that looks for correlations between people's sorts. These correlations are considered dominant factors or discourses. The last step is to describe these factors in a narrative format. These descriptions can provide insight into community attitudes towards the domain in question, can uncover areas of consensus, and can help refine the language with which to engage communities in projects. We have performed Q on the island of Tanna in the Republic of Vanuatu in Melanesia, seeking to reveal the dominant attitudes towards natural resource management of forests and coral reefs in the context of environmental and social and economic change. To ensure the process was well understood and engaging for the participants, we used an illustrator to provide a sketch for each statement card. From the perspective of forest conservation, our initial findings from Tana are encouraging. The strongest correlation, by a significant degree, suggests there's a widely shared discourse of environmental stewardship based on strong, and intimate connections between the community, the landscape, and the resources it provides. This is bound up with traditional practices and community decision-making structures into the concept of custom. A second dominant view is similar to the primary factor with its strong emphasis on environmental stewardship, but it also includes selected elements of modernity 
such as access to clean water and sanitation, and improved medical services. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, we are using a choice experiment to estimate community preferences for the idle structure of a PES scheme. Choice experiments can reveal preferences for ecosystem services provided by forests, where there are no markets or surrogate markets through which people can express those preferences. Respondents are asked to choose between alternative hypothetical outcomes described in terms of different combinations of levels of delivery of a range of environmental attributes. In addition, a monetary value or price tag is normally included as one of the attributes. This is used to reveal compensation rates for loss of service or payment rates for greater environmental quality. When scaled up, these estimations can provide aggregate monetary values for indirect use and non-use values of forest ecosystem services. In this instance, the choice experiment will determine what level of payment might be needed to secure a continuous change in behaviour in how forest resources are exploited. The experiment will also seek to determine people's preferences for how a payment is administered and paid. For example, is there a preference for payment in cash or in kind with goods and services such as household items or community assets such as schools and medical centres? Our findings will be able to help policymakers understand how PES schemes can be best designed to meet the local conditions and preferences. Lastly, we are undertaking a systematic literature review guided by the overarching question of what is the economic value of ecosystem services provided by the world's primary forests? Our review has three steps. Firstly, we have identified the key literature through a broad ranging search of four databases, Scopus, Web of Science, Science Direct and Google. Next, we've been through a screening process, checking for relevance and ensuring the material selected is relevant to our research questions. Finally, we are undertaking eligibility and exclusion assessment as part of our reading and documenting process. In our search, we assessed more than 14,000 results. 1,700 of these were deemed relevant. After removing duplicates, we are left with 1,377 studies for our analysis. We are currently undertaking this third stage and beginning to analyse the data. Our goal is to build a database of ecosystem service values for forests. From this database, we can undertake meta-analyses of the data and ask more specific questions. Protecting forests is as much about people and livelihoods as it is trees, biodiversity and ecosystem integrity. Understanding which ecosystem services are valued, by whom and by how much, can help stimulate the institutions required to enable the value exchanges in forest use and protection to be better reconciled. Harnessing the basket of benefits provided by forests can help demonstrate alternative ways forests can be valued instead of resorting to our default position of simply valuing them as a function of their timber or as a barrier to agricultural development. Okay, so um, hopefully that gives you a bit of a background as to what the economics team are doing and, and some of the overlaps and, and also potential challenges uh, that myself and... Um, Hello and hello. welcome to the Light Earth Creation Day. Well, <laughs> that's an alarming. This <laughs> what's going to connect to connect to you, isn't it? Anyway... Uh, Um, and hopefully it addresses a little bit about this idea of values, and, and your point was right, is that an econo economics only, even a microeconomics approach they're taking is not going to reveal to us everything. But is there some things that the planners, myself, can use in what they're doing? And how do we integrate that? How do I integrate what they find out into something more? Um, I'd like to now introduce... Tim Cadman, my colleague, who's going to tell us about governance, which is really crucial and underpins so much of this, and working out um, how we collaborate. Tim. Right. There 
bear with us a moment. Happy to take any questions while we're doing this. Any questions? I, I'm not sure I can necessarily answer the detailed economic questions. And it's a bit late in Australia, and I promise not to ring them up. So. <laughs> Where's my where's my forest expert? Ah, uh, it's not here. Yes, no, no. So um, yes, it's so the primary forest is um, sometimes similar to the old growth forest. This idea it's forest that has not not been disturbed since the last major shift, um, but it. It doesn't simply, uh, how can I describe it? It, it recognises that forests are always being disturbed. So, so there's no such thing as an undisturbed forest. Um, and I think, I mean, I've witnessed my colleagues um, dis having discussions about defining a primary forest and how to do it. And it's, it's certainly not um, agreed upon and, and they still argue over it. But I think it's about, um, and, and Tim might like to put some better words in my mouth, but it's about um, forests that have not s suffered significant degradation and significant damage, whether that's through logging or just um, other human activity, uh, which is not to say they're not affected by humans. Um, yeah, it's, it's essentially high ecological productivity. So these, these may be forests that have been uh, subject to um, natural events such as um, uh, natural fires or floods, but they've um, self-regenerated and they essentially represent um, the, um, uh, the ecosystem type um, in a um, continual fashion. So in, a, in the case of Europe, these would be um, forests that uh, have existed since the last ice age, uh, they may have had some uh, ecological um, disruption through uh, low-level harvesting, but essentially they are um, fully functioning ecosystems with structural integrity and, um, you know, those kinds of ecological uh, indicators. For example, if you look at um, some of the forests of Siberia, for example, these are uh, huge... Um, tracts of, of forests that have been uh, largely um, unused by, um, you know, um, timber uh, for, well, forever, but they've had fire or they've had other natural uh, events occurring in them. Uh, so while they may not be old growth, they're still intact. Um, so in a sense, intact might be a kind of useful catch term rather than ha hanging this label of oh, this is old growth. Or, you know. um, but we're in the process of creating a whole um, GIS um, uh, set of data on this very um, point. So we'd really love to um, you know, have your input too, Fritz. Well, and certainly, certainly in a project uh, as large as ours, because we're not just active in the tropics as a project, we have a mirror project in the boreal region. So obviously, with only, I think we're 18 months into the research, we probably won't have a definition of um, primary forests until year four. <laughs> um, all right, well... Um, Thanks for the discussion. Yeah, I'm Tim, uh, Tim Cabman. I'm with the Institute for Ethics, Governance and Law uh, at Griffith University. 
Um, and Ed and I are, if you like, uh, two sides of the same coin. Uh, when it comes to uh, social, political and environmental interactions around uh, land use, um, you, uh, governance requires planning and planning uh, requires governance. You, you can't simply uh, land your uh, proposed activity from outer space uh, onto uh, local communities. You actually need to be able to uh, engage actively with local communities and have local communities help you identify what they need uh, to have sustainable uh, land use planning. Uh, but if you have time and you're interested for the rest of my presentation and you want to uh, play on your computer, uh, if you go to surveymonkey.com uh, forward slash r forward slash glp osm 2019, there's a 12 question survey there uh, which will um, generate some results. Um, but just to give you uh, an example of how um, we have used um, online and survey tools to um, generate understanding of local communities and multi-stakeholder views on um, governance for land use. But Ed's point about this transition away from um, this top-down uh, approach to uh, land use. I don't know if uh, many of you have ever engaged with uh, resource agencies in your own country. Um, I did for several decades as an environmental activist uh, and it was extremely difficult to get away from a top-down approach of, oh well, we've written a 10-year uh, wood production plan, uh, we're now in our three-year wood production cycle, uh, we're sending you a notice of intent uh, to let you know that the compartment next to your uh, water supply uh, will be harvested in the next 12 months and you are invited to comment on our management plan. Uh, but this doesn't always work because it can quite often result in conflict. And uh, uh, one side wins uh, and another loses. Um, and uh, very often, ultimately, uh, it's the forest that uh, is the biggest loser of all. So how do we uh, understand uh, governance in a more collaborative uh, and participatory um, environment? Well, first of all, I think we have to understand that governance itself is a, it, is a value-neutral term. It really refers to uh, structures and processes for steering or coordinating relations between stakeholders. That's it. Uh, and that um, coordination or steering or interaction between the different stakeholders in a context can be good, uh, or it can be bad. But if we place collaboration at the centre of how those interactions uh, are managed, uh, we get a slightly different approach from the classic top-down um, uh, management planning that, that we have seen um, in past decades. So if we look at... Uh, the different landscape-based initiatives that might be out there. Uh, this might be, uh, for example, uh, looking at land use planning in Indonesia around uh, multiple use of forests for um, uh, palm oil, uh, for conservation, uh, for timber extraction, uh, for ecological restoration. All these activities may be occurring in a landscape. This landscape might be a very large catchment of five or six hundred thousand hectares, uh, but within that we have multiple uses going on. And very often they are in conflict. But we can understand the governance system that is uh, in existence um, as really being built around what we might call structure and process. And by structure, essentially I mean uh, people. If you like, if we want to view a governance system as a building, uh, the people that are involved in that governance system are like the bricks within that building. 
uh, and the extent to which their interaction one with another uh, is uh, collaborative is a bit like understanding the decision-making processes that are occurring as being the mortar. So the processes that are involved in how those people make decisions uh, and have dialogue one with another, um, the more deliberative those interactions, the more sticky the mortar, the more the bricks stay together, and the more intact um, the building itself is. So if we understand structures being about participation and process about deliberation or discussion, uh, the greater the level of interaction uh, and the more collaborative um, it is, if you like, uh, the better the outcomes. And of course, those outcomes within this system may be substantive uh, in terms of uh, land use plans or, or behavioural. They may influence uh, people to uh, change their perspective or their way uh, of uh, managing uh, the land. And hopefully those interactions look at uh, policies and programs which solve uh, problems that are identified uh, in uh, that particular uh, initiative or place. And essentially, um, it is the quality of those interactions that ultimately determines the effectiveness of that governance system. So that's kind of the theoretical model of the more participatory approach. And then what we've done here is create a... Um, a principal criteria and indicators approach to breaking down those different concepts. And so a principle is a fundamental value um, or rule that you're seeking to uh, achieve. Um, in a governance system, if you want to have a good governance system, you want the participation of the stakeholders to be meaningful. You want them to actually uh, have a role and for um, those participants to behave um, um, responsibly one to another. But you also want the deliberation that occurs to be productive. So not just in terms of um, having uh, good relations, but also in actually producing something. And so we break down the idea of participation into two um, categories for assessment, interest representation uh, and organisational responsibility. And we understand deliberation in terms of, well, if you're talking, you're making decisions. Uh, and, of course, a key component of uh, making decisions is you've got to implement uh, what you uh, agree to. And then at the indicator level, we have basically um, created uh, uh, 11 uh, indicators. And it is at this level that we can actually do the, the scoring because, essentially, uh, indicators are parameters for assessment and these can be verified. Uh, and from those, you can stack back up to the criterion uh, and the principle uh, itself. So I think they're fairly uh, relatively self-evident. Uh, interest representation, that's about making sure all the interests within a land use uh, are represented. Uh, you want there to be a degree of inclusiveness. You want a good spread of different stakeholder types. You want some kind of equality of power relations between those different interests as well. Uh, you don't want one particular set to dominate because then the interests are not really being adequately represented. And, of course, one of the key aspects of representing your interests is you need the resources or the capacity uh, to do so. Uh, for example, if you are having a land use planning session in a village in Indonesia uh, and you don't either compensate people for time lost from the fields uh, or there's no childcare so that the, generally speaking, women uh, are also able to attend, um, because they need to um, have someone look after their children. Those are the kinds of key uh, capacity issues uh, in the kind of local landscape level. But the same thing can also apply in, say, intergovernmental negotiations, for example. 
in the climate talks um, in, at uh, the climate conference that generated the Paris Agreement back in 2015. There were over 300 uh, American um, government delegates. Uh, there was one uh, from Tuvalu. So unless they can clone themselves, their ability to represent the interests of Tuvalu in that context versus 300 Americans uh, is extremely constrained. In terms of organisational responsibility, um, that's just a gravel way of talking about our old friends uh, of accountability uh, and transparency. Obviously, you need to know what the other stakeholders in a given um, land use planning process um, are up to, and they need to know what your views are, um, and at the same time, you need to have, uh, need to be able to uh, hold other stakeholders to account uh, as well. In terms of decision making, we need to see some kind of people power uh, within a decision making process, if you like small d democracy, uh, procedural justice and fairness, um, the, the right to actually have your say. Uh, and you need methods for reaching agreement, rather than just having a chair saying, this is the decision we have made, you need some kind of voting or consensus or, or deliberation, dialogue-based ways uh, of reaching agreement. And if you can't reach agreement, do you have methods for settling disputes? Uh, this is a fundamental uh, component of uh, land, use, um, land use planning, is if you cannot actually uh, address particular grievances or you don't put any efforts in resolving uh, long-standing uh, disputes, the likelihood of your system being effectively governed is going to be quite undermined. This is one of the problems we see, again, at that high level in the UN climate talks. Uh, people generally, if they don't agree uh, or they can't get their way or they have some long-standing uh, grievance, um, they just keep blocking and blocking and blocking uh, until eventually they either get listened to or the policy falls over. But of course, once you've put your um, agreements into practice with your implementation, it's really important to be able to determine has what you have done changed behaviour um, around land use planning, particularly around the negative aspects uh, of existing uh, land management activity and uh, has it actually solved uh, the problem, particularly in the case of forest management, uh, deforestation and forest degradation is a key, uh, a key problem uh, and behaviour change and problem solving of course are, are different. Uh, if we change people's behaviour um, around the use of um, cigarettes uh, as a, a and we stop people smoking cigarettes as the cure for cancer, uh, the problem, uh, but they merely end up chewing tobacco uh, instead or vaping and just get another form of cancer, uh, not in the lung but in the mouth or uh, somewhere else, you haven't really solved this problem. And of course, durability uh, is key. Again, if people stop smoking um, but then two years later take it up again, you haven't really had your implementation impact. And then from this ideal framework, it's possible by working with local communities to identify what inclusiveness, for example, actually means uh, on the ground for a government person, for an indigenous person, uh, for a local aid agency, uh, etc. Uh, real verifiers. Uh, for um, assessing uh, the degree to which uh, inclusiveness, for example, uh, has been met, you can actually generate uh, what we call quality of governance standards. And that will help you determine ultimately uh, the legitimacy uh, of your land use uh, plan. Uh, so if you've got time, um, when you go home, um, 
there's a YouTube video that basically runs you through a process of how to create quality of governance standards. Um, but essentially, just to, to wind up, this is an example of um, a seven-stage process for developing a quality of governance standard in Nepal. This is a standard uh, that we have been uh, working as a kind of uh, research trial uh, for the last uh, seven or eight years. Uh, it's about community forests, so it's not so much about primary forests per se, uh, but it's about helping the community uh, determine how they would like to see their community forests governed. Uh, and this is a project that we've been running in Nepal, and we will now be applying this same methodology to the uh, mid and high elevation uh, forests, uh, which is home to the red panda. Uh, but just to quickly show you, I'm not sure how we're doing for time, Ed. Um, just to say, so we have a, we have a seven-stage process. We run a really quick and dirty online questionnaire uh, gauging views on the 11 indicators. We follow that up with key informant interviews and we generate verifiers for each indicator. And then we run a series of fora and uh, national field and, and multi-stakeholder and local stakeholder uh, workshops and consultations, having created uh, a draft standard. Uh, and we have been successful in working with well over 600 individuals uh, and uh, 18 uh, local communities, uh, national government, uh, aid agencies, uh, and NGOs. Uh, and we've uh, run a pilot of the standard for the, for the last three years uh, and ironed out some of the, some of the wrinkles. Uh, and we now have uh, a full standard for assessing the quality of governance of the forest management of community forests uh, in, in Nepal. And as I say, if you want to do a survey, uh, help yourself. And that'll probably do for me. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, any quick questions? I apologize for running slightly. Oh. Presentation. I have a question about the framework for assessment and the indicators you were talking about. And I was wondering, because for example, you are talking about behavior change or transparency. Which type of metrics are you using to, to measure this? Is that the same for all types of projects, or you, depending on the context, do you define different ones? A absolutely. So the, the, the beauty of using this generic approach is that, yes, um, the, fr the, the framework itself can be applied at any stage of a process um, and at any level, but how you measure those indicators in terms of the verifiers that you want to use are context specific. Um, but having said that, um, those verifiers are geared towards um, seeking uh, information from the, uh, the people that you're working with about practices. Practices that exist that they want to keep, that's a good thing, practices that exist that they want to get rid of because they're having a negative impact uh, and practices that aren't there that should be there to have the desired uh, impact. So it, that's when the means of verification, as we call them, become entirely context specific and they're dif different for each of the stakeholder sectors as well, um, of course. But ultimately, once you have collected all those, you can then go back into an integration exercise and identify the commonalities amongst the different stakeholders uh, and the differences and reflect that in the standard in terms of the practices that, that everybody wants to see and that people want to see changed and that people want to get rid of. Thank you. Um, please, could you explain what you meant uh, with verifiers and how this is done in the framework that you showed? Yeah, okay. So, um, I haven't gone into a, a great level of detail in the presentation, but bear with me and I'll explain now. So, an indicator like inclusiveness 
The way we have uh, worked that through is with the um, online survey at the very beginning, we ask stakeholders to provide comments about what they see as right and wrong uh, w with the, p the particular, whether it's we're working on Red Plus or whether this is uh, some other land use uh, process. Uh, and the respondents provide comments. Those comments then essentially populate what we call a proto-standard with some really basic markers as to what uh, people understand by inclusiveness. Then when we have the multi-stakeholder forums and we do the key uh, informant interviews, we then ask those people, what does inclusiveness mean uh, for you? Uh, what does transparency mean for you? So I'll give you a very concrete example for transparency in Nepal. It's not everybody can read. So a big problem with red, uh, R-E-D-D, -D, um, you know, I'm, we're probably most of us familiar with uh, the, um, the, the, that particular um, um, climate um, negotiation program. Um, the locals kept saying, look, things just happen every three months, so we don't know what's happening. We want our town crier to come and tell us every month what's going on with red. So a verifier for transparency in the context of red in Nepal is a town crier announces red policies in the town every month. So that's how we go from a concept like inclusiveness to a general verifier of people want to be kept informed to this is how we actually measure whether they are being informed. Great, thank you Tim. Um, running a little bit over time, uh, there may not be as much time for discussion, but I'd like to ask Stanley Wapo, who's our um, colleague based in Melanesia and he works with the Melanesian Spearhead Group. Um, and we wanted to bring Stan in because we've talked very much about these academic concepts and our hopes and dreams of how we might do this and the ways we might do it. So Stan uh, works for the Melody Spearhead Group, but he also lives, uh, lived in Papua New Guinea, grew up in Papua New Guinea, now works in Vanuatu. Um, and he's also worked for the con uh, organizations like the UNDP. So he has a very particular idea of what this actually really means in a real context. Uh, but you know, from different points of view. Um, so Stan, if you could come up, and we just asked Stan to talk about his experiences a bit, uh, and what this actually looks like a little bit on the ground. Good afternoon, and thank you, Tim. Uh, sorry, Ed and Tim, for the opportunity. Yeah, I, I just want to quickly uh, reflect on the importance of um, this work and the project to us in Melanesia. Uh, so I'm Stan, I, I work for a sub-regional organization. Uh, uh, it's an inter-government organization uh, which has membership of the Melanesian countries, Papua New Guinea, Solomons, Vanuatu and Fiji, uh, sub-region in the Pacific. And um, we definitely see that uh, one of the most important thing in, in the development is uh, protection of our resources just like in fisheries and forests and the reason why forests are important primary or intact <laughs> intact forests with uh, which have not been uh, significantly uh, uh, impacted by people should be protected because of its importance ecosystem services biodiversity so they're very important for us. And our role is to coordinate with the member countries uh, on taking a sub-regional approach to protection of intact forest or primary forest. So we, 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 we've been working with Griffith for I think the last five years now. They've been part of our uh, supporting us technical assistance uh, in trying to develop the concept and uh, working with our members uh, trying to contribute to national efforts already going on. And, and there's a lot of work going on already by NGOs and philanthropists uh, in different pockets on the ground. But we're working mainly by, uh, with the governments 
uh, trying to see how we can complement their efforts uh, at national level. So that's basically um, what we, we want to do uh, in, in the sub-region. And in terms of value, uh, going back to the question of value, I think, I think it, we, we want to look at the total value, not we realize that, uh, we recognize that the econ economic value is something that uh, communities are looking for, and that's the reason why uh, they're accepting other drivers of development like logging, palm oil, agribusiness. So economic value can play a role in uh, other options for development that are less destructive to communities. So, yeah, we, and that's why we, we want to support this kind of project, which is looking at protecting the forest and exploring those other options of livelihoods. I think I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Stan. Well, maybe if I could just throw you a question and, and ask a little bit about, you know, the, the experience on the ground of, of losing a forest and, and losing, you know, in Melanesia and what that, you know, what, what that actually means to people in Melanesia. Um, because obviously it has been heavily logged and they must derive some benefit from it, but perhaps talking a little bit more about those other values. Yeah, thanks, Ed. I think uh, it's quite obvious that, um, you know, some of the communities that have lost large tracts of forest because of logging, they have just lost uh, land that, uh, for food production and all other activities that are needed for their livelihood. So it's, and, and the rate at which uh, development activities like logging are going into the community, so it's, it's going so fast that we can't cope with, even now we are trying to plan for a conservation project. Uh, we probably might take for five years, <laughs> while, while the planning is going on, that's the lure of going into logging and other activities. And also the, the structures at national level, um, you have other activities that are overlapped on the forest areas as well, like the mining and all those other activities. But if we can uh, strengthen the commitment by communities to value their resources, a more longer term, I think that's, that's important. Eddie, I, I just wanted to jump in and... Um, sure, there's a and, question at the back as well, but... Just give a very yeah. practical example. In the case of palm oil, for example, local communities essentially are selling their forests for clearance for palm oil. They get this very small amount of money for the timber. But what they don't understand is that their grandchildren have essentially become indentured, indentured labour for managing that plantation for forever, uh, and they have lost the forest uh, entirely. So they've gone from being a, a subsi subsistence, uh, cult uh, culturally based um, uh, group of people to, to indentured servants. Yeah, I, I am wondering uh, the role that uh, land tenure plays in the whole process. And then in that sense, uh, you know, community institutions, uh, because uh, is it the case that only a few people have uh, the say in the community and in that sense that it is so easy to transform forest into plantations, for example? Yeah, I think in the, uh, in, in the Melanesian context, um, uh, land tenure is um, our user rights and ownership by tribes and clans. So uh, d big decisions on, uh, like for example, in, in logging are decided by these different clans or even an agri project. Um, but what we are seeing now is everybody seems to be <laughs> going for the development because they think that they're going to get cash from it today. And yes, yeah, so they agree to a lot of the clans because the, the developers go and speak to all these different tribes, different clans, for example, in the logging uh, development. And, and when they speak to all these different tribes, they agree, then they have the development going on, uh, similar to even agribusiness. So 
we are hoping that some of the interventions can help the communities to make better decisions. But, but are they not conscious of the consequences? Or are there no activities or processes that inform them about the consequences of the current decisions that they are taking, not only for the environment, but also for their culture and for their livelihoods and for the future generations? I think there's also other, other factors involved. There's the political influence, there's elite capture. Um, I think the, the people know very well the, the value of the, the forest and the resources. They are under extreme pressure to, to be involved in that cash economy. It's like we're living in two worlds, the, our subsistence system, and at the same time, uh, the need to be, uh, to be involved in the, the modern way of living and the cash economy. So they're caught up in that. And yeah, so. And it's more pronounced in, in, for example, in Papua New Guinea, the mining and logging, and in the Solomons. As you go east, Vanuatu, there's, and Fiji, there's a lot of deforestation, uh, deforestation uh, by the cover, cover industry, where they're creeping into intact forest, clear two or three hectares, and that's small holder level. And then you, you look at the number of people in the community, who clear one or two hectares, then it's quite significant if they're creeping into the intact forest. And then for Solomons and PNG, a lot of large scale uh, agribusiness and logging and mining. Yeah. And I think it's, sorry, just to add to that, I think it's important to remember, you know, while communities own the land, there are thing, you know, um, power, power within communities and, some people might have, you know, not formally, but informally a decision. And I think loggers are very good at identifying people who are going to say yes, and they say yes for everybody. <laughs> and, uh, and then the people are like, oh, did we say yes to this? Yeah. Um, and, and so, and it's, it's, it's a form of corruption and it's a form of, you know, and it, yeah. it's a governance failure in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question to you, like, from your personal experience, but m maybe you can also speak for, for other communities, should rural or forest communities be connected through roads? Hmm. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> you know, personally, I, I tend to think that we have to be really careful about how you place infrastructure because I think when you have roads going into next to the forest, in that forest and those areas, it's, it's inviting people to come in and all kinds of activities, settlements, start, people start going in and making gardens. So when it's isolated, it keeps people away. Yes, but my question is, <laughs> what do the people who already live in the forest, because we heard a lot about communities who live in the forest. Yes. I, I want to know what do they want? Like, do they want a road to access to other communities or to access to more centers with uh, health care and schools and so on? Yes. Like, do they want that? Yes, definitely. They want it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's another... Just to, well, th and this is the challenge you face. How yeah. do you square that circle? I mean, this is, this is exactly what we're wrestling with. These people say they want a road. But, and the assumption we're making there is that road equals deforestation because that's what it tends to be but I think what we're trying to see if we can do is mean actually yes you can have a road provided you know your governance and your planning are such that um, it doesn't lead to the negative impacts but that's only going to work and this is the key point if there is an alternative is there is something that allows them to have the things they want, whether that's a road or solar energy or I don't know, I don't know what they want. <laughs> we'll go and find out but only if they can access that. Um, so how, how, do we, how do we get them to access that? <laughs> but then the question is, I mean, of course, people want road, they want development, they want the children to go to school and uh, they want to connect to the maybe the global economy. So the, I, I think maybe the actual question or maybe the cogent question should be, uh, 
to what extent can one meet both uh, development in the sense to what extent can uh, the communities be con connected to the global or the national economy without destroying the forest or reducing the destruction to the forest to a um, to the minimum and what role does governance or can governance play in that exactly yeah I, yeah I, I, exactly you know what what we are struggling with if you like and try, trying to do is, is how do the, these two worlds colliding you know can we govern that collision in such a way that people benefit and I, forests I, benefit. I think governance has a very important role to play in uh, in our context the governance systems are very weak, I would say, needs strengthening at all levels. And that's one of our challenges. Yeah, okay, thank you guys. <laughs> I think it's a very interesting topic and for me because I'm doing the remote sensing, try to mapping this kind of forest study turbines. But it's uh, very interesting I mean, to think about what to protect the forest be intact. But I think from my personal experience, it's also kind of a balance of protection and development. Because uh, you mentioned, you know, even for the, for the local people, for, for them maybe, yeah, they want to keep their environment, but they also want to keep in pace with the society. You know, they maybe currently they still live in kind of poor or very traditional way, but they also want to share with the new development of the, uh, the, the, the courage. From my personal experience, in uh, Yunnan province in the southern west of China, and there's a lot of natural forests, uh, tropical forests there, but uh, during the past 20 years, even maybe 28 or something, there are lots of deforestation in the tropical forest there. They, but because local people, they want to earn more money, they just um, deforestation for the tropical forest. They plant a lot of rubber plantations, rubber trees. So that can you know, bring them a lot of money. So they can improve their life. Um, because all of the, this forest land that belong to the community, to the individual families, so they can earn the money for the locals. Um, after that, uh, the, the government realized you know, it's not good, we still need to keep some intact tropical forest. So the government uh, built uh, some uh, protected uh, areas. But even so, you know, just the surrounding these protected areas, that are full of the, 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 the rubber plantations. So later on, maybe during the past several years, the government realized, you know, it's still not enough. We just build these isolated uh, protected areas. So now they want to build uh, some corridors, you know, to, to, to uh, contact these um, protected areas. So I think it's uh, so for maybe for government, you know, put some rule, and also for the community, maybe they also need to kind of development, as you mentioned, yeah. Even put some infrastructure, not good to to keep everything intact. But maybe the local people they still need to do some development. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Look, um, I guess there's two things going on. One is what is the what do people understand by development? So if they are already captured in the single bottom line economy of profit maximization and cost externalization, we're looking at an economic system that's based on quantity, not quality. If we're able to demonstrate, as we're hoping to do um, in this project, that there is an economic case for conservation in a triple bottom line economy, in an economy that um, puts value on social, environmental and economic values, is there a way that we can incentivize the local communities to have uh, options that are less destructive? For example, if we are able to secure a commitment from a community that it will set aside 200,000 hectares of intact forest, we need to be able to incentivize the management in the adjacent area for, for example, restoration uh, forestry so we can um, actually provide funds for that forest to be expanded. In the same way, can we link 
the agricultural activities that are happening in that area to markets that are prepared to pay a preferential price in recognition of a, a brand that says this carver is primary forest friendly. So in the Kayapo case study, for example, they already have a range of uh, tourism activities, uh, not, um, catch and release fishing, for example. Uh, they also provide um, uh, oil to Estee Lauder for their, um, for their makeup. So what we're trying to do is actually look at the resources that the communities have now uh, that can be uh, maximised without having to go out to um, the traditional markets of rubber or uh, palm oil. Or, and, and of course that's the challenge. And there's an element of that, and I'll have to wrap it up quickly, that is, there is a trade-off for the, for the community and that they have to choose, which is you, you can get your money right now by selling your trees for logging, and you will get X amount of money right now, or you'll probably get less money because these things are not as intensive and they're not, but the, you get that money over the, your, your life, your children's life, and the next generations. And then that's you know, a concept that we you know, can't deal with. <laughs> no, people can't deal with it generally. So this is the challenge we're trying to face. Um, we're happy to keep the discussion going, but we do need to free up the room. Um, and we'll be thrown out fairly shortly. Thank you very much for attending and for staying. We were hoping it was going to be a bit more interactive. We were hoping to do the survey, but it doesn't work with four or five people, unfortunately. Um, but I hope you found it interesting anyway. Thank you. Thank you.